climate, karma plane Jupiter was what I uh, build the talk out. Um, I'm probably going to talk more about Karma Pi than climate and Jupiter here. It's going to be a little bit of a mixed gab bag. Um, I'm John Gill. I'm here from Bermuda. That's why I'm dressed a little peculiarly. Uh, this is how we go to work there. Um, and nobody bats an eyelid when you turn up dressed to work or with shorts and socks and what have you. Uh, I've been working trying to develop open source awareness and community in Bermuda for several years and I have a little project of mine which I started I guess about a year or so ago I came to the pike to, to the caravan a year ago and I gave a talk again about climate and uh, Jupiter and data and the, the basis of that talk was that um, uh, it's, it's kind of my belief that uh, small islands, of which there are many in the Caribbean, uh, really need to be studying the consequences of climate change uh, for their island, uh, because if they don't do it themselves, nobody's going to do it for them. But a, a really effective way that, that we can make progress here is for the islands to combine local knowledge. And I know in Bermuda, there's an incredible local knowledge, uh, particularly about hurricanes. We've had four of them in the last three years. Actually, five if you count, Alex. It wasn't a hurricane when it hit Bermuda. Uh, and, and every time there's a hurricane in Bermuda, uh, you can go down to a local bar and you'll get 10 life-saving tips from the guy next to you. Um, and and the, the island is actually very resilient. And we can, hopefully, we can take some of the knowledge that we got in Bermuda and other, to other islands and help deal with that. Uh, the, so the idea here is local knowledge, but combined with global collaboration, which is essentially what goes on in the Python community. Um, so Karma Pi is a little project I started. I'm not sure where it's going. It's got a sort of, it's really my toolkit for studying data uh, and visualizing and exploring. And it's where I, I uh, it's, it's what I use to, to, to do whatever I'm exploring at the time and it keeps going in iterations of I have some ideas about what I'm trying to do and then I start coding and I realize I've got bigger problems and we get diverted. So I'm John Gill. Uh, I've been working in, in the reinsurance industry and for, for the last 20 years and doing sort of catastrophe modeling. So they, they, it sounds very sophisticated. It's actually a lot of what we do isn't very sophisticated, but we run 10,000 years of hypothetical hurricanes to assess what the potential losses are for an insurance company that we might be writing insurance for. And, and not just hurricanes, but earthquakes and global stuff. Um, so so that's, that's my, prior to that, I, I had another background working with the, with the British government. Um, I can't tell you too much about that, but uh, Edward Snowden may have told you a little bit about what I used to do. Um, I left actually before those the internet came along, so I, I plead not guilty for this. So this talk I'm actually giving with with a uh, one of with the code in Karma Pi, um, and I, I more recently the last sort of couple of months, I've been uh, I, w I was using Jupiter for a while, and uh, I wanted to produce tools that 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 non coders can use to explore data. Uh, I also work in with these two guys. We have a, a, um, a, a sort of tech incubator place in, in Bermuda that I'm hanging out in a bit of the time and we teach young kids about Pythons. We, about Python, we're, we're working with Raspberry Pis or I just rebooted this by pl unplugging the wire. Um, and we, we've been busy sort of trying to teach ourselves so we can teach the kids and build in our own tools. So it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, effort. So let's, let's move on. So I've told you a little bit about me. My, so my name is John, John Gill, uh, but growing up I was always Johnny, and at school I was always Gilly. Um, now, hands up who's, uh, so we're all Python, a little, little bit of, which versions of Python are people using? Who's, who's using still on Python 2.7? Yeah. 
Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Um, what about Python 3 people? And 3.5? 3, 3.4? 3, okay, we tend to use the version that's available on the platform we're using. Um, I've sort of very recently discovered Python 3.5 and I'm going to be talking about some features there. So who's heard of the global interpreter lot? Okay, that's good. I, I use Python for quite a few names. It's, it, it's referred to as the GIL or the Global Interpreter Lot. Uh, I've been to conferences where people have given talks about GILectomy. They're talking about removing the GIL from Python. Obviously, this is a little bit disturbing for me. Um, Guido Van Rossum, actually, at, at PyCon, in one of the PyCons in his keynote, he, he said yes, there was been an, yet another talk about, by a guy who's doing some great work removing the GIL. Uh, unlike previous attempts, he succeeded. Uh, and Python only runs three times slower now that he's removed the gill. And he, he said, he had this marvelous phrase, he's got a lot of these low-hanging watermelons that, that he, and he may be able to do some great stuff. So I'm gonna say a little bit more later and talk about what this gill thing is. Um, but I'd like to also say this talk sort of is intended to work on multiple levels. Um, and I've been also thinking about removing the gill from the process um, in terms of, um, you know, you don't, so, so the, the global interpreter lot, what it's about is if you've got, if you've got multiple threads running in your Python program, um, it, for a thread to take control of the, of the Python, um, so, so, so basically the interpreter, how does it work? If a thread wants to do something, it has to grow, grab the global interpreter lock so that only one of the threads can be running at the same time. And this, uh, this involves, basically the problem is if you have multiple threads running at the same time, they may be trying to change the same memory at the same time and, and all bad things can happen. So Gita's solution to that was, well, have a lock, you grab the lock, you do your thing, you release the lock and let somebody go. You can think of that in, 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 in the development process. We're all global interpreter locks. You know, if, if you're, someone's waiting on you to action a pull request, you're the lock. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk about three, three pictures uh, that have a thousand stories for them. So this, this lady, actually, can we take the lights down a bit? Because the slides are, They look better with uh, a little less light on the screen. Oh, it's coming from the window. Never mind. So this is Princess Cricket. Uh, it's a, a, a painting drawn by a Bermudian artist. Um, so in Bermuda, who, who, who knows cricket? I'm, I'm probably in the part of the Caribbean where there's no cricket. But think if when I say cricket, just say baseball and we'll be good. Um, so. Bermuda, every summer, last weekend of July, beginning of August, it has a national holiday called Cup Match. One end of the island, St. George, plays Somerset for two days in a cricket match, as you do. This started actually as a celebration. Well, the first day of Cup Match is Emancipation Day in Bermuda. It's a national holiday to celebrate emancipation of the slaves. And uh, what well, better way to celebrate by having a cricket match? St. George, their colors are light blue and dark blue. Somerset, red and dark blue. Every Bermudan, uh, within months of being born, their parents have decided whether they're going to be following Somerset or St. George. And some, some people do change their allegiance, I think, but, but it's a pretty rare thing. And it's an intense time in Bermuda. My wife went down to the local uh, store to buy the newspaper, she wandered in, she'd accidentally put on light blue and dark blue and, and the owner wouldn't serve her. He said, we don't serve your type around here, go home and change and then you can have your newspaper. So this lady, she's called Princess Cricket and she's whoever you want her to be. She, she follows, she's kind of like in both camps, she follows both sides and whoever wins, she wins. And she's taken the path of least resistance to lo through life. I like to think of, you know, maybe we're all here. We're Princess Cricket today. We're on a journey. Um, we're making choices through life. We're going to 
follow the path of least resistance. But you can see in her eyes, she's made some choices in the past and you know, she had to take a path. Maybe it wasn't the one she really wanted to do. She, she had to make a choice, time was moving. Uh, which brings me, fork in the road, same artist. When we're writing code, uh, we're forking projects. Uh, if, you, if you look at a Git tree, there are trees everywhere. We're, we're always making choices writing code. Well, am I going to use this library? Am I going to use that library? Uh, sometimes, as we're on our journey, and, and again in Bermuda, we all ride mopeds. Sometimes you come to a fork in the road, you've already kind of decided you're going right. If you try and change your mind, you're going to hit the tree. So you're going right. It doesn't matter whether, and it might look beautiful down the other fork in the road, you can't take it. Sometimes we're going a little bit slow. We can have a sit down by the tree, watch the world go by, and have a think about which route we want to take. And uh, this sort of leads me to uh, one, of, one of my philosophies on software development at the moment is actually if you wait a month, things are moving so fast that, that, that you might, uh, you know, somebody might do the work for you. Uh, and certainly your perspective will change. So procrastination driven development is, is a thing. Now, same artist. You can think of the leaves on the tree are journeys that people have taken. Uh, the tree on the left might be the Python community. It's got a solid trunk. We've gone zooming up that trunk. We created Django. We created Pandas. We created Matplotlib. We created a whole world of wondrousness. On the right, there's the Ruby world. They got Ruby on Rails. I don't know. They, maybe the tree on the right is R, which has data frames. It has GNU plot. Um, what, we, what we're seeing in the software world, uh, it's a young industry, and the simultaneous invention of solutions to the same problems, but, but often we're on different trees that can't work together. Some of us have taken a journey, we're at a leaf at the end of the tree, uh, you know, the branch is over here, they can't even see that there's another tree over here, they're off in their own world. Uh, now, there might be a tree over here, we might be in a forest, and maybe they're having conversations over here and life is good. What I like to think is where we are today at, at this conference, it's a place, we're in the heart of, of the tree, it's where the leaves are talking to each other, they're exchanging experiences, we're talking about how we got here, we're sharing perspectives, and that's really where you really learn. And that's where innovation happens. That's the heart of our, our business. Down on the ground, there's new trees trying to grow, new ideas, but they're surrounded by these giant trees. Maybe they'll never get to, to, um, to flourish. Um, so again, we're back to this idea of collaboration. One, one of the things I'm finding in my own work is that the... Uh, the software problem has largely been solved at this point. Um, we can do incredible things in a very small amount of time with the tools that other people have already created for us. What I'm running to in my work is um, data. So the, there's incredible data sets out there that can help with our understanding of the climate and our natural hazards, uh, but uh, they tend to be very fragmented. And a lot of these data sets are, are open and the people who've created them are delighted for you to use them, but you still have to register, you have to grab the data, you have to understand what it really is, you have to spend, right, you know, spend a, a morning getting it working in Pandas and looking at it. And that work is being repeated over and over again by multiple people. Um, one, one data set that I've been looking at a bit is the, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. They, have, they, can, they will give you 40 years daily on, on a 0.75 degree, degree grid worldwide, about 100 different variables, but typically maximum temperature, minimum temperature, evaporation, precipitation, solar radiation. And the, this data set is created by using basically taking historical records and running 
running numerical weather predict models to, to crank out the data. So they, these will give you a 40-year view of how the world's climate change. And, and, and unfortunately, I haven't got an animation for you today, uh, but you can actually animate the, the warming of the planet with these data sets. The problem is each variable takes about eight gigabytes of data. So, uh, and you don't want to DOS the European Center for Medium Range Weather if we all go out and we all try and download all, all the variables plus there's the storage of that data. So, each variable, so, so it's, it's, as I say, it's, it's about a 480 by 240 grid of data. So, so that's uh, whatever, however many numbers it is. And you've got one number for every day since 1979. So it, it, if you only store that as a 32-bit float, it, it works out. Now, we, there are things you can do. You can quantize the data, and you can probably shrink it. But you, know, you can probably get it down to 2 gigabytes, and compression will probably help. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's big data sets. And I say every month, there's more data. And, 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 and that's just one of these data sets. You know, the, the, the US NOIA has similar data sets. Um, so one of my goals with Karma Pi was, well, how do we manage, how, how do we make this data available, share the work, share the storage? Uh, my, my thought is that perhaps what you want to have is, is locally you, you, you would want sort of monthly totals, say, for this data. Um, so aggregate it so you have smaller data, but locally for, say, Bermuda, I'd like the most detailed data I can possibly get on, on, on that island so that I can see how the, what's going on globally as historically affect what happens locally, fit models to it, and, and, and understand what the changing climate is, is going to mean for us. So I mentioned the global interpreter lock before. Uh, so, so there's a question, why, why, why do people want to re eliminate the global interpreter lock from Python? And, and what it really boils down to is you, you might be writing some application, and it, it really became, I, as I say, I've been using Python for quite a few years without knowing that this thing even existed. And then I, I started writing a, a graphical user interface. And at that point, to keep your user interface responsive, you end up spinning off another thread to run it while you do other stuff. Uh, and, and I was hoping that I could do my calculations in one thread, and because I got a multiple CPU machine whilst running the UI in the other. But the global interpreter lock means that there's only one thread running at a time. So at that point, I stopped worrying about the global interpreter lock and said, you know what? If I want to use multiple CPUs, I'll just use multiple processors and, and not have them have to communicate. So back to Karma Pi again, another of my philosophies in what I'm trying to do here is it's a project where you get out of it what you put into it. Uh, and it's also a project where my belief is that if, if you've got a network of computers and you want to get the best use out of those computers, you can do really, really well if you don't have to worry about security. Let's say you've got an isolated network, everybody with access are good players. Uh, and not only that, if the processors that are running on your network are playing nicely. So we're talking about co cooperative, collaborative processes on a computer. And it turns out, if you get any large organization of people, you can think of the people as processors. And in this Python community, we've got a beautiful collaborative multiprocessing environment where people are acting in good faith, sharing their code, and it works really, really well. Most large organizations are not like that. Uh, but that doesn't mean our computers can't be like that. So uh, global interpreter lock, wouldn't it be nice to get rid of it so that we can write code, use all the resources that we've got, Everything will be good. I don't know whether you can read the, the title at the top. Async, death, await, run. So hands up who understands what the async and await keywords do. OK. 
These are two new keywords that arrived in, in Python 3. Point, oh, I'll, I'll backstep a bit. Who's used the yield keyword in Python? OK, we got, another, we got one more of that. So, so for a long while in Python, you've been able to write these things called generators. And, and a generator, it looks like a function, but it typically will have some sort of loop. And then once around the loop, it'll yield some value. Uh, what you can use, you can use these uh, basically for if you want to iterate over values. Generator is your friend. Uh, when you call a generator, it doesn't do anything. It gives you an object that you can then iterate over. All right. If you create a function and you uh, and you write instead of writing def and then the function, you do async def. That tells the Python interpreter that what you're writing is what's called a coroutine. And, and if you call that coroutine, all you get back is a coroutine object that you can then do other wonderful things with it. And, and, and the idea with a coroutine object is, is you'll typically have two coroutines that are busy passing data and information between each other. What Now, the, there's a... Now I'm going to start flanneling because <laughs> so I, about a month ago, until a month ago, I, I hadn't really worked with, with async and AWAIT at all. Uh, I'd been in this world where if I want to make the full use of my computer, I just write uh, systems that, um, that will just spread things out as separate processes, and I'll have processes that don't need to communicate with each other, and then some code around it. Like, so doing something like map reduce, you know, you fire off a number of processes to farm out parts of your simulation, then you gather up the results. Um, I discovered a project. Oh, I'll come back to Jupiter. So I discovered a project called Cure.io. There's a, has, has anybody ever been to a talk by David Beasley or watched them online? OK. So David Beasley is, is possibly one, well, one of the things that I love about coming to these Python conferences is you meet incredible people who are just totally entertaining and, and doing incredible work. So I, I don't know how I came across Cure.io, but I, I, I think I, it was on Twitter someone mentioned it, and I heard it, a lot of these projects tend to come into my consciousness. You, you, you see them mentioned a couple of times. You eventually go to GitHub, and you start reading the readme. Well, I clicked on the development notes, and it, and it had this opening line which said, please don't use this code. It's probably an epically bad idea. So at this point, I was intrigued and, and obviously had to use the code because it was an epically bad idea. And then it said, um, at times, you will feel as though, you know, when you're, when you're working with, with Cure.io, it will be like you are being attacked by swarms of stinging bats. So this is my visualization of the swarms of sting, stinging bats. Um, Sometimes the bat density can get pretty high. Um, as you sort of start to relax with Cure.io, the bat density will drop. And sometimes you get down to almost no bats. Yeah, no bats. There we go. Low bat density. So what does Cure.io do? What Cure.io does is it's a very small library whose job is to manage a bunch of tasks, and tasks are just coroutines. And it will allow you to set timeouts on tasks. It'll allow you to cancel tasks. Uh, and it'll allow you to spawn new tasks. It will allow you to spawn a task in a separate process. And ooh, interesting. Time went fast. So. The best thing about Cure.io, it comes with a monitor which will show you all the tasks that are running on your computer. And apologies about the small text. These are all the tasks that are running in this presentation. So we've got about 30 tasks. 
Um, the communication between tasks tends to work by you push data onto a queue and you can pop it off in another task. And David Be Beasley, QRAI does all the magic for you. His stuff is really super easy to use. Um, and what I've got in this, this thing, each slide here is a separate widget, and some of the slides have their own uh, coroutine that are driving them. So the, the bat there had its coroutine. Here's another widget I've got. This is an animation uh, I collected during Hurricane Nicol, which was on the 13th of October, 2016. I was collecting the data from the Bermuda radar weather. I'm kind of intrigued by this. If you look at it closely, you'll see there's kind of some star patterns around the, uh, the X in the middle there. On oh, the data became unavailable when the radar went out because the winds were getting pretty damn strong at that point. It's actually just after the eye. Do you see the star pattern there? I don't know whether that's an artifact of a radar or something really fascinating, and that's one of my future jobs. You can zoom in on this. Oh, no, you can't if you press the wrong key. Let's try B for Bermuda. So this is a zoomed-in view. Um, there's one point you get this beautiful hibiscus pattern over, over, the, uh, over St. David's. Oh, it's died on me. I hate that. Uh, <laughs> Sorry? See? It, it, the, the, it's not taking the keyboards, the whole GUI is crashed on me. <laughs> um. Sorry? Yeah, so actually the keyboards died. What the? I told you the bit stinging bat. Um, this is unfortunate because there's a the next slide is rather good. Jesus, so. I've got a mouse, but that's all, and the mouse isn't... Oh! I'm just going to have to kill it. Oh, that might have done it. Ah! Okay, we're, we're back. Okay, let's fire up again. Looks like I uh, have quite a serious problem. No usable directory found in. Okay, we're going to go for a reboot. Actually, let's try to log out. Don't you just hate life down here? Yeah. Oh, I, I have a feeling I know what. I, you know what? It's going to be a reboot. This. So, um, do you mind if I overrun a little bit due to uh, technical issues? Okay. Yeah, so I was nearly done.
Okay, we're back. So this is where we were moving on. Uh, so what, what I'm trying to do with Karma Pi, each of these widgets, the, the, none of these displays here, uh, there's a lot of code. I'm, I'm mostly using, Ma I'm all pretty much exclusively using map.lab. This is one I knocked together 10 minutes before the talk here. Um, and it's just related to the climate thing. The red line is the sun, number of sunspots. And we have a record going back 250 years of sunspot activity. It turns out sunspot activity is highly correlated with um, the amount of energy that's arriving on, on Earth. Um, the blue line is a model that a, a guy called Scafetta fitted where it turns out that and the sunspot activity follows a sort of quasi-periodic 22-year cycle. Um, it, it's intriguingly related to the orbit of Jupiter around the sun. Uh, and this guy, Scavetta, has fitted a model that relate, takes the orbit of Jupiter and, and its um, harmony with Saturn. And this is what the blue line is. And you can see it. It's a pretty damn good approximation and predictor of sunspot activity. What's interesting about that is, it'll, and, and, and his paper, Skvetter, he's used um, um, isotopic records going back millennia uh, and shown that, that this same model um, pretty much predicts ice ages. Uh, intriguing stuff. Uh, suggest that uh, uh, one other interesting thing about the sunspot activity, uh, there was a dip in activity, uh, I think around this time, uh, and, and the climate deniers were, were using that to say, well, this increase in activity here is, um, is what's driving global warming, not man's activity. Turned out, actually, the dip wasn't as big as we thought it was because the dip was actually due to the fact that the astronomer in Zurich that was making the recordings, was, his eyesight was failing. So there weren't fewer sunspots. It was just he couldn't see as many. Um, another little thing I have here, uh, it's one I'm working on. Uh, it's a work in progress. I think this is the waveform coming in from a microphone on here. I, I've got a little project. I want to be able to control this thing with my guitar, because why not? But I actually want to work on better human computer interfaces within this. But also, this also shows, I'll go away. This also shows um, how within the Curio, so the, one of, some of the tasks here are there's a task that's reading the data from the, the microphone. This, this uh, map plot widget is animating the plotting. The, the potential, it is so incredibly easy with Curio to build this sort of stuff. We're in an exciting world. Just go away. Uh, this is uh, the Fourier transform. It's what's called a sonogram. So I'm doing Fourier transforms of that waveform. I actually think I'm not actually picking up the microphone data correctly. If anybody uses, knows Pi Audio, I need your help um, in decoding the data properly, because I, I don't think this is fully working yet. But we, we have some, um, have some keyboard, uh, keyboard interaction with this, um, so you can explore your sonograms. This is part of my trying to figure out how to decode uh, music and then use the music to control. You can use XKCD plots with Matplotlib again. Um, so what I've got at the moment is a, a, a nice little framework. It's evolving rapidly. Um, I'm going to be hacking on this tomorrow if anybody wants to come and work with me and, and learn a little bit more about where this project is going. It's a little bit, but if we get back to, um, oh, this is my infinity slalom widget. Um, Callan here has been helping me with this, and his email address is infinity slalom. So I'm just plotting random sine waves here. and. Um, what I'm finding, I say I started off using Jupiter. I wanted animated map plot lib plots. There's 20 ways to do it. All of them were intensely frustrating to get working. 
and so I ended up writing my own. Uh, half past 12. I guess I've gone over, have I? It is half 12. This is actually, this code was written by Guido, Guido Van Rossum. And he had a clock that had three revolving disks. And I put this up as my final slide so it would remind me what time it is and, and give you an opportunity to ask me some questions. Um, and again, this is being run by a Curio task, a co-routine. Finally. Oh. I blew it. I lost my slides. So I'll, I'll, with that, I'll, uh, I'll finish. I'm sorry it was a little bit all over the map there. Have we got any questions? Questions are good. No? So what I invite, the, the moral of the async thing is that it's in some sense, or between it, Curio, we no longer need to get rid of the gill. Um, when that... Uh, when, it, when the sonogram there is running, I get 280% CPU usage uh, from a thing that's a single process I fired up, and I'm not even sure where all the stuff is going on. Um, it, it's, this is going to be so powerful. Uh, we can have Curio can manage 10,000 tasks simultaneously in a sim single process. Each of those tasks could be a process running on a different CPU and a different computer somewhere. So they, the, the potential for uh, data analysis, simulation, and understanding our planet with these tools is, is incredible. So what I was going to say is be Princess Cricket. Find, be whoever you want to be. Follow your path. But let's meet up in the middle of the trees and share our ideas and in our journeys and what we've learned on the way. That's that's Thank it. You very much.